pitch black here outside, uh, but I'm very sorry. I, I, after all the time I spent in Korea, I just wasn't able to, to swing another trip. But I, I am also excited to tell you about some of the conclusions from the special report. And I don't have a lot of illustrations, but thought it would be nice to have at least one of the figures. So that's what you can see on the screen. And maybe we should just start with that where we have on the this is one of the figures from the summary for policymakers there is a lot more very nice information in the, in the underlying chapters uh, but i'll focus a little bit initially on what's in the summary for policymakers all right and that's this is is figure three from the summary it shows 3a to be precise it shows the decline of co2 on the left side of this panel in in all of the various pathways that we examined where the the blue shading is what we focused on uh, which are the pathways that do not uh, substantially overshoot 1.5 and then return that's the gray band there on the left with the higher CO2 emissions. And so the blue area really shows the what has to happen for CO2 if you don't want to uh, miss the 1.5 degree target. And that is essentially uh, by 2020, which is awfully soon as we all know, uh, in very rapid declines begin in every single one of these scenarios. And you get down to zero by mid-century is typical in these scenarios, but you get down to almost 50% cut in 2030, depending on exactly what you use for your reference. It is about 50% relative to 2020. It's about 45% relative to 2010. And so these are really major drops in CO2, and if you've seen any of the news coverage about the special report, that's really what it's focused on. But I, I like this figure in particular as it really shows these two side by side. The left is CO2, the right is non-CO2, and that's really how the conclusions of the report are put across, that when we talk about uh, the, the reductions in CO2, that same line giving the number that I just read out to you about 45 percent drop in CO2 by 2030 just 10 years down the line also points out that you have to have deep reductions in non-CO2 and of course that's a little bit harder to give a number for because there's a variety of non-CO2 and so the right shows that uh, for methane and for black carbon, so we feature in this figure two of our key coalition target pollutants. Uh, there are very large drops in, in emissions of both of these pollutants. These are given in all in units of relative change compared to 2010. So by definition, 2010 is one. And you could see that, that methane has very large drops by say uh, 2040, we're about half of current methane, same thing for black carbon. And you can see nitrous oxide actually does something different. And it does go down in most scenarios, but it doesn't go down in all scenarios. And so that's one of the challenges of, of saying something um, easily digestible about non-CO2 emissions is that they behave differently depending on the particular pollutant. So I think we have very strong conclusions about the warming agents, about methane and black carbon in particular, and it's it's harder to, to draw definitive conclusions about what happens in some of the others. I should also point out, and, and you could ask uh, Amparo or Vigdis about this as well, that we do define non-CO2 emissions within the summary for policymakers. We didn't really have room to have separate figures on say non-CO2 long-lived greenhouse gases and then non-CO2 short-lived cooling agents and SLCPs. So I, I never got the sense that there was opposition to talking about SLCPs, there simply wasn't room for more than two categories. So we have an explanation that non-CO2 emissions include the short-lived um, 
short-lived climate forcers, and that includes both cooling and warming agents, as well as some long-lived greenhouse gases like nitrous oxide that are shown here. Um, I, I want to say a few other, other things, and maybe I will, uh, for the moment now, stop sharing my screen, so I don't really have any, any of the other figures to show you. Uh, but what I wanted to point out was that there's a, there's a fairly extensive discussion of how we achieve reductions in uh, all the various sectors of the uh, socioeconomic activities. And so, as you might expect, things like the discussion of the energy sector are, are very CO2 focused. And I think that makes perfect sense. Um, we also, however, have a lot of discussion of areas such as the agricultural sector and land use. And there, there is a, is a, a good deal of discussion of short-lived climate forces. And in particular, there's a lot of discussion about methane. So I can read you, for example, a, a, a headline statement or a key summary, key finding from the executive summary of the fourth chapter of the special report, uh, which says, though CO2 dominates long-term warming, the reduction of warming short-lived climate forcers, so by calling it warming short-lived climate forcers, it makes it equivalent to SLCPs in that uh, text, such as methane and black carbon can in the short term contribute significantly to limit warming to 1.5 C. And then it goes on to say these reductions have substantial co-benefits. And one thing that I hadn't seen so much before in IPCC reports, but is much more apparent in the special report, is the link to sustainable development, sustainable development and socioeconomic uh, feasibility. And so it says not only uh, would they have substantial co-benefits, including improved health uh, due to reduced air pollution, but this in turn, the presence of the co-benefits, enhances the institutional and socio-cultural feasibility of such actions. So I think that's a really powerful conclusion. That's the kind of thing we have we have said all along within the coalition. The fact that they give you powerful co-benefits means that, that that can enhance acceptability, can enhance achievement, and can even go so far as to en encourage uh, action on, on a broader range of both climate and sustainable development uh, goals. So I wanted to turn to one other area when we talk about things like um, agriculture. There is a specific uh, section where it talks about how we might achieve transitions in, in land use more broadly that would be consistent with 1.5. And one of those is very specifically changes towards less resource intensive diets. That's again from the summary for policymakers. In the underlying chapter, it really describes how changes towards less resource intensive diets are one of the key behavioral shifts that can reduce agricultural methane. It, it goes further and talks about additional methods uh, much, much of the uh, material there is taken from work produced by the SAP, from Andy Haynes's paper uh, last year, from, from some of my work and some work from Marcus's group at YASA. And it, it describes how there are changes to feed for cattle, how there are uh, methanogenic uh, bacteria inhibitors that can be given to cattle, et cetera. And so there's a great deal of discussion there. This is not in the in the summary for policymakers, but uh, down in the chapter. I would note that within the summary for policymakers, there is a second figure, or the second half of actually the figure I showed before you, before to you, which describes the the transitions in the energy uh, and land use sectors under various 1.5 degree scenarios. And it includes changes in agricultural methane, which are uh, extremely large in some cases. So agricultural methane by 2030 
drops from, um, well, in some scenarios it actually increases. In the typical scenario, it drops by about 10 to 30 percent, and in some scenarios, it drops by as much as 50 percent. Um, in addition, the the figure that I just showed you, you know, includes a, a large reduction in use of natural gas in general. So, fugitive methane, and as well as targeted measures in the oil and gas sector, uh, reduce non-agricultural methane quite substantially. So, I think there's there's a lot of of excellent discussion in particular about land use and agriculture for methane, um, also about the fossil fuel sector. There is a, a fairly short discussion of the overlap between non-CO2 emissions and emissions of CO2, uh, sorry, yes, uh, non-CO2 emissions and emissions of CO2 uh, in general, the the discussion talks about how some scenario, some sectors such as black carbon from motor vehicles, from diesel, and methane from oil and gas, do overlap with CO2 uh, mitigation policies in very stringent. 1.5 degree scenarios, because in such scenarios, you essentially move away from internal combustion engines of any sort in the transport sector, and you essentially move away from all fossil fuels in the energy sector. So by definition, you, you're not leaking methane from the natural gas sector if you don't have much of a natural gas sector anymore, and, and there are no diesels. Um, there are specific discussions of things like cook stoves, and how those are important and not part of the mainstream energy sector that's treated in most of these models for the sake of CO2 mitigation. Um, so I, I think as essentially I would say that the report uh, really underlines the importance of reducing both non-CO2 and CO2. Um, the headline statement from the summary for policymakers. Actually, yes, there is one one other thing that I definitely wanted to point out, and then I'll stop and see if maybe there are a couple questions. Um, but in the very top headline statement from section C of the policy, summary for policymakers, which is emission pathways and system transitions consistent with 1.5 degree C global warming. The last sentence is non-CO2 emissions in pathways that limit global warming to 1.5 C show deep reductions that are similar to those in pathways limiting warming to 2C. So the point here is, I mean, the, the, the top level point is that you have to have deep reductions in any of these scenarios with very low warming in 1.5 or 2C. Um, the, the sort of second level point, which is not as immediately obvious to everybody who reads that sentence, but I think is nonetheless very uh, useful for us to be cognizant of is that the re the reason they are similarly deep is because the integrated assessment models that are looking at how to optimize economically optimize the mitigation of climate change they already find that reducing SLCPs is such a cost effective measure that they deploy every scenario every measure with in those models, even at two degrees C. So the reason that there's the 1.5 has similarly deep reductions to two is because these are such good options that the models take all of them that they can at two and there's not any additional left at 1.5. Um, I, I have heard people talk about that and saying, oh, well, see, that means it doesn't really matter if it's 1.5. I think it actually reinforces the point that these measures are extremely cost effective and 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 therefore that some of the very first things we do under any low warming scenario and that the the modeling community has really recognized that and again this is just simply considering the mitigation costs this is not accounting for all the benefits that come along and we do highlight those benefits as well for example, the uh, one last sentence from the summary for policymakers says, improved air quality resulting from projected reductions in many non-CO2 emissions 
provide direct and immediate population health benefits in all 1.5 degree C model pathways. So to me, this is really a, a, a large body of, of work that uh, in this assessment that supports both the, the rationale for targeting uh, the, the SLCPs, it supports the, the co-benefits, it supports the social and institutional feasibility of taking, taking these on and really highlights how they are, they are both extremely appealing um, and a key part of the solution.